the student is what makes or breaks everything. So if, if you were to go to a prestigious, well-known school and didn't apply yourself, then you're not going to do very well, right? Hello, hello, hello. What's going on, my friends? Um, do you like my backdrop? Uh, let me change my backdrop to none. Uh, as you are joining here, Arushi, Abby, Abdul, Adam, Aisha, Akia, Alec, Alex, Alicia. Uh, what is going on, my friends? We are... Um, make sure he's not hanging out here. We are waiting for our guest. We may uh, not have a guest tonight. We'll see. Um... If we do, we do. If we don't, I'm here to answer some questions. Uh, how do you track the shadowing hours? Go read eshadowing.com, the FAQs. That will help you. Just found the channel on YouTube. It's been helpful. Just ordered all of your books. Nice. What's going on, Alicia? Um, lots of A names. Yes. We've got tons of A names. Um, all right. So let's assume our guest isn't showing up today. And uh, it's just going to be me and you. Uh, if you want to leave, you can leave. If you want to hang out and ask some questions, you got me for an hour. Uh, so what, would, what do you want to do? If you want to ask a question, go ahead and raise your hand. I'll allow you to unmute. We are in a, a webinar Zoom, so you cannot unmute yourself, but uh, I can uh, get you to unmute. Uh, hello, Sarah. Hi, Dr. Gray. Can you hear me? I can. Awesome. Thank you uh, for taking some questions instead. Um, yeah. Sorry, my voice sounds really raspy. I have a terrible cold. Oh, no. Feel better. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about, um, I've watched your videos on YouTube about preparing my MD, PhD essay, mm -hmm. and I'm struggling a little bit right now to really tie in the showing and not telling aspects because it's it's a shorter piece mm -hmm. and I'm I'm just wondering if you have any recommendations on like should I pick a couple of specific instances in the same ways that I've tried to show not tell with my activities mm -hmm. and just keep it short and then provide really concrete reflection or should I, because I guess the way I write it right now is I talk a little bit about why MD, a little bit about why PhD, and then at the end tie together why I don't really see myself doing one without the other. <laughs> yeah, so so it's tricky, right? Because for the MD, PhD application, you still have the normal personal statement, right? Yeah. And so the normal personal statement is why MD, why, why physician. And so for me, the why MD, PhD, is not necessarily why MD and then why PhD. It, it really is that why combined. What what is it about the PhD angle? Why do you have to have both? So I think if if you're able to kind of um, do that same showing, not telling of of the experiences that you've had that have led you down this path to knowing you want to be a physician researcher, a uh, physician scientist, then then I think that's great. And then your research essay um, is the one where you kind of dig into some of the specific nerdiness of research it's been a uh, it's been really interesting because i i did a master's before uh going to medical school because i really didn't know if i wanted to yeah. do the combined degree and i'm not sure if i wanted to dedicate the time commitment to that career path and the master's degree and the education and then combining it with the clinical uh components that i feel that is really what I, told me yes this is definitely like what I want to do yeah. and so my my research essay I'm trying to keep as short as possible because there's so many research pieces that go into it from my master's but yeah um, yeah okay cool. thank you so much I appreciate it yeah you're welcome all right so let's get Sarah's hand down Abby hello hi Dr. Gray what's up um, so I'm actually a part of your application academy, and I was just planning on asking 
later, but now that <laughs> we have this time, <laughs> might as well do it now. Might as well. Um, just a quick question. I'm still just polishing off my um, personal statement and all of my activities. And I hadn't really heard about anybody asking specifically. I was trying to look through the recordings, but just are we allowed to use common acronyms regarding hospitals like ED, ER, and titles like EMT and all that? Uh, what was that last one you said? EMT. Oh, EMT. Uh, yeah, I think for those super, super basic ones, okay. I think you're fine. Um, I know some you do have to explain, but... Yeah, define it first. Okay, cool. Thank you so much. <laughs> Sarah's like... <laughs> Um, application Academy comrades, not the other AA. <laughs> we, we have that problem always of like, do we say AA or do we just call it Academy? <laughs> Austin, hello. Hi. So I'm a current applicant. Okay. And I got accepted into Ross in the Caribbean. Okay. Um, but this is my first time applying and I'm waitlisted for two schools. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering... At what point do I just say I might reapply because I'm really hesitant about going Caribbean on yeah. the first application cycle? Yeah, or I, I think that hesitation is good. Um, so my general advice is uh, don't go to a Caribbean medical school unless you have to go to a Caribbean medical school. Yeah. So uh, typically my advice is uh, first application cycle, second application cycle, third application cycle. Okay, let's let's start thinking about it. All right. So just wait on, try to wait on the wait list. I, I would wait on the wait list and then I would potentially see where you think your application is being held up. What, what is it about your application that is, um, that is not, um, getting more schools to, to jump at you. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Alicia. Hello. Hi, Dr. Gray. Um, I wanted to ask, when do you know when to stop editing your personal statement? I feel like I've gone through so many rounds. Never. And, yeah. Uh, um, yeah. Um, so there, there's a quote that's perfect for this that I love. And, and the quote is, maybe you've heard me say it, great art is never finished. It just stops in interesting places. Okay. At, at, at some point, you just got to go. It's good enough. And and yes, you could nitpick it all day, every day, and never be done with it. But at some point, <laughs> you have to be good enough with it. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, I heard that quote in a podcast. I'm like, oh my gosh. <laughs> I, I used my my Siri to send me a reminder. Like, remind me of this quote. Uh, that was good. Arushi. Hi, Dr. Gray. Um, so I had a I just had a question about um, so I'm a rising freshman. Um, for college, and I'm interested in pursuing the, or very interested in pursuing the um, pre-med path, and I just had, um, so I've seen your videos, and I have a general idea, I think, of um, what the kinds of things that I should do, um, and just, like, overall for pre-med, and not necessarily hit it like a checklist, um, because that's what you're not supposed to do, I've heard, but, <laughs> um, so do you have just any, um, do, do you have just any like uh, advice for what we should do, like as rising college freshmen who want to be pre-meds um, over the summer or just like in the first year? Um, and I actually have a friend um, in the in the in the webinar right now who's also um, she goes to my school and we nice. um, are both attending right now. Um, but uh, we're I'm like asking for both of us just like things that we can do for. Um, yeah that sort of thing yeah. yeah so as as sarah mentioned keep a general uh generals are good <laughs> or journal same thing um the uh mapped so mappd.com free account go and track all of your courses all of your activities use that as your journal so that everything is all in one place uh obviously i'm biased because that's that's our product but again it's free for you to do all that stuff um at the end of the day my biggest piece of advice for for first year students is to focus on being a student first. And the biggest mistake that students, I, I typically see is students 
take on too much too fast. And they're like, okay, I got to do it all. I got to shadow. I got to get clinical experience. I got to volunteer. I got to be the president of a club. I need to go create a new club. I need to go save the world. I need to go cure cancer. I need to end world hunger. All, like all of this stuff they're doing all at once. And then they walk away out of their, their um, fall semester class or spring and they have a 2.5 GPA because they, they were doing too much and didn't focus on being a student. So that's really my biggest piece of advice. Just focus on being a good student and then layer in things as you can go. With the, the biggest piece of advice being clinical experience is probably the most, most important. Shadowing is, um, is under that. Um, research is somewhat important, um, but barely. And then good community service, volunteer stuff, um, I'm a good human being type activities are great. And, and then also remember to keep being yourself. So the, the activities and hobbies and things that you like to do, don't mm -hmm. stop doing those things too. Okay. That's, that's super helpful. Um, actually following up on one thing um, that you said, if, if it's okay, could I ask a quick question about? Sure. Um, okay. So uh, regarding clinical experience, I heard that um, being an EMT is something that pre-meds uh, can do to get clinical experience and so um how do you like do you recommend that how do you like how how do you recommend we go about that process if we want to or that sort yeah. of thing Be being an emt is great uh it obviously depends on a certain personality and demeanor you have to be okay with um kind of the urgency of being a first responder depending on kind of the company that you sign on with some EMT companies are basically transport companies, um, and you're basically you're you're a glorified Uber driver. Um, but other companies, you're going out to to uh, motor vehicle collisions and, and other stuff where you're going to be a treating provider as a as a first responder. So you have to be okay with that first and foremost. So don't pick something that you're not going to like because you just know in your your personality it's not going to be good. So there, as Aisha mentioned, there's a lot of other um places where you can get clinical activity if if being an emt is something you want to do then you need to go get an emt certificate and go find a job just like any other job all right got it that's that's all very helpful thank you so much great um i do not recommend working virtually uh, anymore being a virtual scribe was great during the pandemic i absolutely do not recommend it now um i think it's it's a uh a waste of time to do virtual scribing. Hello, Adam. Hello, can you hear me all right? I can. All right, thank you. I actually have two questions uh, about my application. So I'll be yeah. submit, I'm trying to get it all together so I can yeah. submit early in June. Yeah, uh, just pause, pause for one second. For the people that are joining now that maybe weren't here at the beginning, our guest, uh, um, I guess we had some some issues with communication. So we don't have a guest today unless he just happens to show up at some point, but it, it's just me taking some questions. So that's what's going on. All right, go ahead, Adam. Yeah, so my first question is in one of the activities that I've been doing and get, getting really involved in um, is it's a volunteer with a hospice organization. And essentially what has happened kind of rel relatively recently is for the most of my volunteer experience, I've been kind of at patient homes or in kind of hospice facilities mm -hmm. working with patients. But recently I got to do sort of very, it's very intertwined with that, but it's distinctly different. It's like this outreach work that I do to different facilities. And I also give presentations to caregivers. So I was wondering if you think it's a good idea in my activities descriptions to kind of separate that into two separate activities, even though they're under the same kind of organization. I, I think the question comes down to how different are those activities, not necessarily from a location standpoint but what are you doing and if, is the impact that different that you may want to separate them out so i think you just have to ask yourself what the what the ultimate goal of separating them out is all right thank you and then my second question is with another activity that i do i do call counseling for the national suicide hotline and mm -hmm. i was wondering if because that's obviously a lot of patient interaction but would that be considered clinical? I'm not really sure where to put this on the scale of everything because it's also virtual call counseling. Yeah. When you say call counseling, what do you mean? Is it like a crisis hotline? Yeah, it's 988, the National Suicide and Crisis suicide. Hotline. Yeah, Yeah, great. Uh, I would count that as clinical. Um, I, I know that it's 
probably a very personal question to begin with. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think what you're doing is no different than a, a virtual encounter that a physician has of like, hey, like what's going on? Um, obviously, you're not you're not a treating provider, but you're offering guidance and and support and all kinds of good stuff. So um, I don't know pre pandemic if if I would have said, oh, that's clinical. But I I think looking back on everything, I I would recommend marking it as clinical. All right, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, you're welcome. All right, uh, Ananya. Hello, Dr. Gray. Can you hear Hello. me? I can hear you. Did I say Thank your you name okay? Opp- Perfect. <laughs> um, I had a question regarding research um, okay. labs. So two questions. Does it matter what type of research we're doing? I have a psychology research lab uh, that I'm very interested in joining both as like a double major in biology and psychology, but I'm wondering if one looks better than the other. Uh, no. I think research is research is research as long as it's typically following the scientific method of having a hypothesis and gathering data and and trying to analyze that data, all that good stuff. I think you're you're fine. I, I had a student I always talk about when this question comes up. I had a student who was a geologist and all of her study was rocks. <laughs> like it was great. It, it worked fine. Okay, and then does it show a lack of focus if you join both, or is it better to really fully commit to one? I I think it's fine. Okay. Um, And then does paid research versus like volunteering in a research lab, does one look better than the other? Like, are they seen differently? Same, same. Okay. Um, Those were all my questions. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Alicia. Hi again. Um, I had a question about um, research experiences as well. Um, okay. I know I'm also an MD PhD applicant. Um, and um, so should I be including research experiences as activities? Um, my only concern is just because I'm going to be talking about those same activities um, or talking about those same things in my research statement. Yes. Um, you, or you, you still list yeah. them as activities. Okay. And so then should my focus in my activity section not be... It, it shouldn't be explaining the science. It should be talking about my different, um, I guess, like experiences and like applications of that research. For the essay or for the activity section? For the activity section. Yeah, I don't think you need to explain the science in the activity section. You'll have, you'll have room for that in the research essay. Perfect. All right. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Lena, hello. Hi, Dr. Gray. Can you hear me all right? I can hear you. Um, So my question is about clinical experience. I had a volunteering position at a hospital pre-pandemic where I used to interact with patients at the um, day surgery clinic and I used to give them warm blankets and it looked like it's very clear that it's clinical experience. Um, However, after the pandemic, I was called back again, but my my role was modified and that I couldn't uh, like spend the time with the patients like once they were prepped um, and waiting to go to a surgery. But instead I was out in the waiting room um, dealing with families as uh, answering their questions, um, welcoming in new patients that um, had questions or were just starting their process to get prepped for surgery. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm not sure if I should um, divide those two like pre and post pandemic, try to keep them as one, or are they both considered clinical experience? So the, the latter, what you're explaining sounds a little less clinical, a little more admin related. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you may want to separate those out. I, I don't, I, ultimately there are no rules for that kind of stuff. Um, but I think if you're, there may be some question of integrity if you're like, oh, I have a thousand hours of this and half of it is non, non-clinical non stuff, there may be a question there. Right, okay. Thank you very much. Yep. Hello, Hannah. Hi, Um. can you hear me okay? Yep, yep. So I wanted to ask about the clinical experience 
So I used to work full time at a hospital as a nursing assistant. Okay. And then I started my master's program, which it got to be too much doing both. And so um, I worked for a little less than a year, but I did get over a thousand hours. And I was just wondering if it was a red flag to them that it was less than a year that I worked or if having more than a thousand hours was plenty of clinical experience. Yeah. So I, I my stance on this is pretty firm that I, I don't care how many hours you have. What I care is that your actions match your your um, your words. And your words are, hey, I want to be a doctor. I like the clinical environment and I, I'm ready to go full time into this world. But your actions don't show that, mm -hmm. right? Your actions show, oh, look, I got some hours and now I'm done. I can go do something else now. Okay. So my biggest thing for experiences, I don't care if you have 100 hours or 1,000 hours, I want to see consistency and recency in your, your activities. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Yasmin. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? I can. Yes. Hi, Dr. J. Thanks for hosting this session. Yeah. So my question was really basic. Maybe someone asked it uh, previously, but how is virtual shadowing evaluated by the medical school committee, especially as it was like the gold option during the COVID pandemic? Yeah, I, I think... Any question that revolves around how is a school going to review it, the answer is always going to be, it depends, right? It depends on the admissions committee. It depends on the individual reviewer. It depends on the school, et cetera. So I, I can't answer that broadly. What I can say is that I, I talked to an admissions committee member the other day. I was at a conference and they're like, Ryan, do you do virtual shadowing? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, we do e-shadowing. They're like, I know I recognize your name. She's like, I've been seeing e-shadowing all over applications, people people doing virtual shadowing. She's like, it's great. Um, so I, I, it just, it's going to depend on, on the school and who's reading it. I think uh, at this point in the pandemic or post-pandemic or wherever we are in the pandemic, um, you should be getting in-person shadowing. And uh, if you want to continue to get virtual shadowing, great, but you should also be getting in-person shadowing. And then Perfect. I would just Thank I would you. just combine them all into one activity. I don't think you need to separate out in person and virtual. I see. Okay. And if I can follow up on this question, so yeah. I am a student, well, an applicant from Canada. Uh, here, shadowing is a little bit more difficult to yep. get into compared to the U.S. It so is. I have like a few hours here and there in different specialties, but yeah, my my main shadowing experience was virtual um yep. would the comedy like consider the fact that shadowing opportunities are limited in canada sure i mean they they know that so okay awesome yeah. all right thank you you're welcome <clears throat> aisha Hi, can you hear me? I can. Okay, so for leadership experience, I had got um with this group called CASA. I don't know if you heard of that before. No. So it's basically where like I mentor a child, kind of like social work. Well, have to oh, call. you're you're uh court appointed um what is that? Court court appointed something. Is that what yeah, you're talking I can't, about? I can't, it's on the tip of my tongue. I can't think of it, but like where I make sure like the child is safe with the guardian and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like a social advocate. Yeah. So you make sure they, they show up, they're safe. They, yeah, yeah. I, I got yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't call that leadership. You wouldn't? No, okay. I wouldn't call that leader. I, I think it's a super awesome activity, um, mm -hmm. uh, but I wouldn't call it leadership. Okay. So that would be kind of like non-clinical. I would probably you're you're volunteering, right? You don't get paid for yeah. that. Yeah, no, I don't. Um, get paid. I I would either just call it a an extracurricular activity. I would call it just community service, non clinical. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but yeah, I I I know of that job, and I've talked to several people who do that job, and it sounds mm -hmm. amazing and and super uh, uh, impactful for everyone involved. So right. I 
I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry that it's not leadership. I think it's a phenomenal uh, experience. Okay. So what, um, what would you count as leadership? I'm having some trouble. I don't really want to be a president of a club. <laughs> so don't be a president of a club. Who says you need leadership? Oh, uh, okay. I thought there was a requirement. Like, no, uh, isn't there? there's no requirements in this game. Uh, okay. yeah. So I, I think you just have to know yourself, right? Mm -hmm. And and if you don't really consider yourself the president type, then why try to force that? True. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Merv. Merv? Merv? How you say that? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's Merva. Merva. You, you say yeah, the yeah, ending. Merva. All right. What's up? Yeah. Hi. So I just have a quick brief question here. My friend Arushi actually spoke earlier. I am the friend that she was talking about. I'm also a rising freshman. So about to start my undergraduate education. Um, I have not committed to a school yet, but the date is approaching and I May am first, also. Right? Yep. Ex yep. May 1st. <laughs> uh, so about six days left. Um, I am going to be um, going through the pre-med track. Okay. I do want to attend med school. Okay. I'm uh, more than committed. So I, what I've been having trouble with is deciding an undergrad only because, uh, because I know I want to go to med school and I know that later on I'm going to be getting into some significant debt. So I would like to, so I'm avoiding that now. Yes. I spoke to a Much few people possible. and, and everybody's saying, take, like, go wherever you can afford. So mm -hmm. I got a school. It's, a, it's not a bad school at all. Actually, it's actually an, a good school. Um, I got a full ride. And on top of that, they would actually be paying me to attend. <laughs> and so, I mean, like, it's great, right? Um, yeah. It's not really like a well-known school. It's a SUNY school. Okay. Again, not bad. But what worries me is that I would somehow be putting myself at a disadvantage. And again, when I do talk to a few people, they were like, only if you don't apply yourself in that school. Yeah, so I exactly, really just exactly. wanted to hear it from I, you. I love that. What I love that think? advice. Yeah, no, I love that advice because the school doesn't make you. You are the only one who can make you, right? So you could you could take two uh, Mervas and, <laughs> and send one to the quote-unquote well-known prestigious school and one to the uh, SUNY school that isn't well-known, mm -hmm. although I don't know how many SUNY schools aren't well-known. <laughs> maybe, maybe pace pace isn't that well known but uh, it's geneseo just okay just <laughs> um the uh the student is what makes or breaks everything so if if mm -hmm. you were to go to a prestigious well-known school and didn't apply yourself then you're not going to do very well right yeah. but if you go to a lesser well-known school and you apply yourself and you go out and network and you look for opportunities and, and you, you do the best you can do, as long as you think the school that you are going to um, will have the ability to support you in what you wanna do. So let me, let me preface that a little bit more. So where is the school that you got into with this full ride? You, you named it, but where it's, are they? Yeah, SUNY, in, in oh, uh, Geneseo. It's uh, Geneseo, New York. Where is that? My assumption is it's in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, sort of. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> All right, yep. I'm going to Google it. Uh, All right, sounds good. SUNY Geneseo. All right, I got yeah. it. So, Someone said Western New York. Yeah. All right, let me see. Maps. All right, so SUNY Geneseo. Okay, you're, uh, you're near Buffalo and Rochester. So yes. I, th I think you'd be fine there. My biggest concern would be the amount of resources available to you as a pre-med student, right? Potentially, if you're interested in getting involved in medical research, well, you're not that far of a drive from, from, uh, from Buffalo, right? So you have University of Buffalo, you have, um, you have Rochester as well. So you have two medical schools not too far away from you, right? Unless I'm mistaken. Yes. No, no, you're completely okay. right. Actually, okay. I am in Rochester. I would be commuting to Geneseo. And I did actually come across this problem. And I was like, okay, well, I wouldn't really have too many resources and opportunities. At, like, if, as if, you know, if I were to attend like U of R. Um, I did look into U of R. U of R. They do have a 
surf program. So it's a summer undergraduate research program. You don't, do not have to be a look student. At, yeah, I, I wouldn't worry about like these official title programs and stuff. Yeah. You okay. knock on doors and go, <laughs> hey, Mr. Doctor. Hey, Mrs. Doctor, what are you doing? I'm a pre-med student. Can I do something for you? <laughs> right? Okay. And, and you just knock on doors. But but the 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 point I'm making is that those doors are close enough for you, right? You can you can yes. commute to Rochester, you can commute to Buffalo. Where? Oh, hold on. Uh, you you can do that, right? So so I'm not concerned about the location of the school for you to have access to the type of types of people that you need access to. Are you I in understand. Rochester now? I am. Yes, I live in Rochester. Yep. So right. I would be commuting to Dennis too. Yeah. So so stay tuned. Uh, <laughs> The end, uh, not end of, uh, June 6th, uh, that week of June 6th, I'm going to be in Niagara Falls for a conference. Um, so number one, we're going to have a meetup. So come hang out, have dinner, and just, just meet some people. Um, and then at some point that week, there will be a pre-health fair for students to meet different schools in that area and, and across that kind of region. So stay tuned for that news. Oh my goodness. Wow. That just got me so excited. That That is just so good to hear. Wow. Yeah. What a, what a, wow. That made me so happy. Okay. Good. Well, thank you so, so much. So um, moral of the yeah. story, take the full ride, yep. take the money. Take it. All right. <laughs> You're going to be great there. Sounds good. Okay. If, I will, I will take your you like word for it. Out, digging out of six feet of uh, lake effect snow. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay i've been here for so long i'm used to it i'll nice four more years won't be a problem but thank All you right. so much i really yeah, appreciate it and i will hope to see you in june thank Sounds you good. Bye, bye all right rosemary hi dr gray Hello. i had a question about oh, for shadowing mm -hmm. for if we want to list like our shadowing experiences in the activity section if we yep. want so if we've done like e-shadowing when like the pandemic started would we just lump that all under like e-shadowing and list that just as one thing? Yep. So virtual shadowing, in-person shadowing, just one activity, lump it all together. Okay. And then for, I guess like point of contact for that, who should, does it matter like who we put for that, like in terms of like e-shadowing or should we do uh, it through the program? Whatever, like, pro example, yeah, whatever program, uh, my contact information is on the e-shadowing website for what to put down. Okay, great. And then also for in terms of like in person shadowing, yep. I never know if it's like how long I should stay with physician. Like, am I sort of annoying them if I just like shadowed them for months on end, or if like if I really like that specialty? I don't know yeah, if they're if you like it and they're letting you come back, then obviously you're not annoying them too much. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. Yeah, I think most students would would uh, hope for that sort of arrangement. Okay. Who's next? Nitty. Hello. Hi. Uh, so I have a few questions relating to shadowing. Um, All right. I was wondering, uh, does it matter how many different specialties you shadow? Nope. Okay. So some people will tell you, you should shadow three types of doctors. Like I don't play that game. It's hard enough to find one person. Okay. So like, for me, I've been shadowing a gastroenterologist for like since January. Okay. And I'm just wondering if I should look at other specialties as well, um, especially like over summer break and all of that. If you um, want to. Okay. Uh, and I also wanted to know, um, shadowing isn't considered clinical experience, right? Correct. On the AMCAS application, they're, they are separate categories. Clinical and shadowing are two separate categories. Okay. Um, is clinical experience important for high schoolers looking for BSMD programs? Because I'm kind of confused how to get. Yeah, um, I, I will be honest with you. Uh, I have no idea. Uh, I don't play with BSMD. I don't recommend BSMD. So I don't, I don't know the, is the answer. Okay. My assumption is that it would be important because you're still applying to medical school at that point. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I don't, I don't know how significantly uh, medical school admissions looks at BSMD candidates and what they're looking for. Because obviously, as a minor, you have a lot less opportunity for that exposure. Okay, um, so I'm on a first aid squad, but I don't think anything I'm doing on it right now, at least, is 
necessarily clinical. I mean, I've written down some of the patient's medications and gotten equipment, but okay. I haven't really taken care of the patients directly. So okay. that doesn't count, right? I don't know. It just depends. Okay. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. Have a good day. You're welcome. Who's next? Hey, Vez back. Uh, hi. Yes. Just out of curiosity, my friend and I, we both heard you say this just now. Um, why don't you recommend BSMDs? Like I'm past the application cycle and whatever, but I'm just yeah. curious yeah. to know. Just Yeah. So I, I don't recommend BSMD because uh, you guys are still babies, <laughs> right? Basically. Um, there are a lot of extra pressures, I think, that students are going through the process, human psychology, for any of you psychologists out there, any psychology majors out there, you've learned this. Human psychology is uh, very much driven toward the fear of losing something you already have. And so if you are a BSMD candidate and, and the, the program that you get accepted to is like, okay, great, you get an automatic acceptance into our program. If you maintain this specific GPA, and you get uh, this specific score on the MCAT and whatever other re requirements and hoops they, they're gonna make you jump through. There's a lot of pressure for you to perform up to a standard that maybe you're not ready to perform at. And so it's, it's giving you a lot of stress that ultimately you're not really getting any sort of benefit. Yeah, maybe you start medical school a year early, but is that a benefit? I don't think so because you're missing out on growing up and being a kid and learning how to be social and be a 21 year old and 22 year old and whatever else um, that, that I think the, the cons outweigh the, the benefits. Um, a lot of BSMD programs, like they have super high requirements. I, I was talking to uh, some parents the other day and and one of the requirements for like their kid that they were looking at a BSMD program is you have to get a like a 517 MCAT score I'm like who's requesting a five like that's not a true BSMD program that's that's like hey come to our program like not a lot of people get 517s it's a ridiculous ask to to get so I just think it adds so much extra stress and pressure on students as they're trying to figure out who they are and what they want to be in this world that it's just not worth it. And ultimately, I think a lot of parents are driving the decision and not the student. So that's why. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Yasmin. Yes, hi again. Um, so I had a question. So I did a master's uh, in experimental medicine and I, I had to work with like patient samples sometimes going like to the OR. Um, would this be considered as a clinical experience or not? What are you doing? Uh, so I had like, you know, contact with the surgeon and I'm basically taking care of like biobanking and then performing experiences on the actual uh, tumor biopsy. Like or yeah, so you're, you're doing like lab science stuff. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, not clinical. Not clinical. Good question. What would be examples? Cl clinical yeah. is interacting with patients, doing things with patients, to patients, etc. And if it's uh, experience interacting with patients, uh, like uh, families, would that count as well? Not families, patients. Patients. Oh, okay. And then the I also had a question. Phlebotomist, hospice care, CNA, medical assistant, ER tech, uh, scrub tech, um, lo lots of stuff like that. Right. And how many hours of clinical experience of this type? Consistency are... and recency is more important than total hours. Okay. And then I also had a question regarding uh, the actual application. Yeah. So I'm interested in applying to the MD PhD. Okay. But I've heard that if ever one doesn't get accepted to the MD PhD, he could be considered for the MD program. Is this like depends true? on the school. 
Yeah, it depends on the school if they'll consider you just for the MD program. And do you know, like, what's the percentage of schools that do that? Or? No idea. And is it like well seen on the AMCAS application if one selects both MD programs and uh, both MD and MD PhD programs? Say that again. Yeah. So on the AMCAS application, is it like a good thing to mention that I'm interested in both the MD and MD PhD programs? Or it's not a good you're, idea. you're only applying to one. So when when you assign schools, you're you're selecting if you're applying to their MD PhD program or not. So you can't apply to the same school, their MD program and their MD PhD program. That's my understanding. If if I'm wrong, if someone can correct me. Um, but you can on the same application apply to MD PhD programs and separate schools just their md program so uh, you you can mix and match um but you can't apply to one program to both just md and md phd right perfect yeah that answers thank you yep anna hi it's me again um so i talked earlier about working as a cna um full-time yep. during night shifts while I was doing my master's program in the biomedical sciences. And then I kind of had to quit like a little less than a year. Um, and so I asked if that was a red flag, but how would I go about kind of remedying that situation since the application is opening kind of soon? Yeah. Um, so I was just wondering like if you had any recommendations on how to kind of go off with that situation. Uh, I think you you need to show that you're getting back into clinical experience as soon as possible. Okay, so just try to find something. Um, something try to, try to find something and, and show on your application that you're going to do it through the application cycle. Gotcha. Thank you. Yep. Arushi. Uh, Hi again, Dr. Gray. Um, so I had a question. It's kind of along the lines of um, what Marva asked earlier. Um, so I have committed to a school and um, it's a fairly expensive school actually. And um, I, uh, there, there's, uh, I've heard that there's a solid amount of uh, competition and I've heard also grade deflation, um, which isn't awesome, but um, <laughs> <laughs> um, how do you just, with those things in mind, like, how do you think that I could best optimize, like, my chances of, you know, not failing in <laughs> well, pre-med? You, you, you probably won't fail as a pre-med, so, so okay. that's fine. Um, that's yeah, I think it's just a matter of, of knowing that you're going to probably need to ask for help early and often. Um, go to as many office hours as you can. Try to, try to get ahead of everything. Um, and then in terms of the competition, like it is what it is. Uh, unfortunately, at a lot of schools, the pre-med culture is pretty toxic, um, but you don't have to participate in that. And you can, you can be that kind of ray of sunshine fighting through all of the, the evil darkness. So mm -hmm. just do, do the best you can. Okay, that's good to hear. Um, and in general, like in a school where there's a lot of pre-meds um, on average, um, do you think that there's going to be like a, like within from the school that med schools will be more or less selective necessarily because there will be probably a lot of it i mean like it's it's cornell so there's like a lot of people coming uh probably a lot of people applying to med school from there so do you think that medical schools would be um more or less like selective from there or think no, like being nitpicky so. sort of i don't think so okay yeah, I, I, don't, I actually don't know if Cornell's that big of a pre-med school. I'm going to look and see. Okay. Um, so the WMC does provide some, some data. Uh, the only reason I ask is because um, everyone that's there is probably like amazing. And I would have to be just as amazing, you know, to... Yeah, but, but, but the, the problem the problem is you're assuming that 
medical schools are comparing you against everyone else. And, and they, they are, but they aren't, right? They're looking at your application alone in a silo going, is this someone we want to interview or is this not? They're not looking at you, putting you in a lineup going, okay, let's pick the best one out of these 10 people from this one school. They, they just, they, they don't have the bandwidth to, to get that nuanced. Okay. Um, so if we look at this, let's see. So I'll share my screen here so you can kind of see this PDF document from the AAMC is undergraduate institutions supplying 50 or more students, um, more applicants. So we can search, oh, there's Cornell right there. So yeah, it is actually pretty big, 405. Mm -hmm. um, here's my school, <laughs> 860. We we're big oh. ones. Um, so it's, it's interesting. These top four usually are always kind of switching places. Um, UCLA is typically always the, the biggest. It's a massive, massive school. So yeah, Cornell's, uh, Cornell's there. Have fun. Got <laughs> okay. Well, thank you. All right. Yep. Alicia. Hi, Hi Dr. Dr. Gray. <laughs> Um, I was going to ask, um, how do you make research statements engaging? Because I know personal statements are engaging by the stories that we tell. Yeah. Um, but the research statements focus more on. Yeah, I, I wouldn't worry about it. Research. These are nerdy PhDs that are reading them. So <laughs> I wouldn't worry about engaging. Um, I would, okay. Uh, just be careful with going too detailed into the nuances of the science. Okay, sure. Thank you. Yep. Right, Lena, hello. Hi, Dr. Gray. Can you hear me all right? I can. Is this Lena from App Academy? No. Um, no, no. Okay. Um, you, if I um, heard correctly, um, you mentioned that there is activities that we um, can put in that we can do throughout the application cycle, like um, like I submit my application in early June, um, but there's like an activity that I started in the summer and just like just beginning, like maybe done one or two or three hours. Um, and this would be mostly for uh, clinical experience. So I'm wondering if you could speak a bit more about that. Speak about what? So like, like how it like, if it's like all right, if we just done like one or two hours or like barely started um, and still being able to put it in as an activity. What's the alternative? Uh, not to put it in. <laughs> those, those are the only two questions, right? I, I think it helps that AMCAS now has the anticipated hours. So you can, you can only, for the completed hours, it'll only be a couple, but your anticipated hours, it'll be hopefully a lot more, so. Oh, okay. Uh, so obviously, it's, it's it's not going to be super impactful because you're not going to have much to say about it, but it, right. at least it'll show that you're doing something. Okay. So, um, so I'm just starting to familiarize myself with the like the application process and everything. Um, because I'm a Canadian student and okay. applying to the the U.S. So you can put in anticipated hours as well as. Mm -hmm. like completed hours yep i okay. highly recommend reading the actual and applicant guide the instruction manual for the application just so you understand all of the nuances but yeah you you put in anticipated hours and completed hours on amcas thank you very much yep oh sorry ignore that alina um all right mariva's back Hi, I am back. This is just a quick question regarding what you had mentioned, like hopefully in June, Niagara Falls. I did yep. ask a chat on how I could follow up with you on that. Yep. Um, so just how yeah. should I, how would you like watch watch the emails? Are you in the Facebook group at all? The pre med hangout? I don't have Facebook, but I will join it. I'll get Facebook just so I could take that. Yeah. Either either Instagram <laughs> uh or the our email list. Uh we'll, we'll sounds send good. information on both. All right, sounds good. Thank yep. you. You're welcome. All right, friends, I will end there. Uh, hopefully, I was just as good as a vascular surgeon. <laughs> Did some Q&A today. Uh, hopefully, that was helpful. I hope you all have a wonderful, wonderful week. I will 
See you soon. Bye-bye.